Okay. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our speakers and viewers joining us from across the globe. Welcome to the virtual event of Freedom Hour, an online event hosted by the Asia Freedom Institute, which is a nonprofit organization that calls for democracy and religious freedom in Tibet and China. I'm Sakina Bhatt, and I'm the moderator uh, for this very important discussion. Today's panel, we are going to delve into a crucial topic, Tibet at the front line of global climate crisis. Tibet is Tibet is experiencing the impacts of climate change more intensely than many other areas on the planet and the consequences are not just local but it's global. We are honored to have with us Emily Ye, a professor at the University of Colorado. Uh, we have David Boyd, the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Environment. And we have uh, Lupsang Yangso, Research and Campaign Assistant at International Tibet Network. And I would like to tell our viewers that I have kept the introduction of, the, of our speakers really short uh, to save more time for the discussion. But if you want to get the full um, bio of our, of, of our speakers, then you can always go to Asia Freedom Institute's website. Uh, a very warm welcome to our dear panelists to AFI's discussion. And to our viewers, I would like to quickly run you through the agenda for today. So we will be starting off with one general question. Um, so all our speakers will have five minutes to give your answers, uh, followed by uh, three in, uh, Three rounds of individual, two rounds of individual questions, and for the individual questions, our speakers will have three minutes uh, to give your answers, and then finally we'll have one general question, and for that, uh, the speakers will have five minutes uh, to give their answers. And uh, without further ado, I would like to start with the first general question, and we are planning to start with Emily, followed by David and Lopsangla. So Emily, I would like to start uh, with a report published in the journal Nature, uh, Nature Climate Change in 2022, uh, which concluded that climate change has uh, led to severe depletion in the freshwater storage on the Tibetan Plateau and the loss of over 10 billion tons of water a year since 2002. In what other ways the climate change is impacting the plateau? To what extent has the problem been uh, has the problem been caused or exacerbated by the policies of the uh, of the Chinese government? Tibetan communities are bearing the brunt of the impact of climate change. How can their knowledge of traditional stewards of the land and the ecosystem contribute to a better understanding of the effects of changing climate and help mitigate uh, some of the problems? Emily, the screen is yours. Uh, great, thank you so much for uh, for having me. Um, and let's start to let's start song to anyone who um, might be watching uh, from uh, who's Tibetan. Um, so yeah, thank you for this question. You know, uh, climate change, as you mentioned, is happening um, sort of. Uh, a global temperature, or sorry, temp temperatures are rising about two to three times the global average uh, on the Tibetan plateau. But the important <clears throat> issues are, <clears throat> excuse me, um, um, more intense, uh, frequent, and higher duration of climate extremes compared to places of equivalent latitudes, as well as compared to other parts of China, for example. Um, there's an increase in heat extremes, um, increase in maximum temperatures. There's also an increase in minimum temperatures, and that might not sound like a big deal in a cold environment, but in fact um, is very important for uh, ecosystems that are adapted to that sort of zero degree uh, line. Um, and that has implications for grassland degradation, um, among, among other issues. So there's also permafrost thaw, um, uh, that's quite significant. This leads to, of course, threats to infrastructure. Um, it also releases carbon and accelerates water in a positive feedback. You have, as you mentioned um, uh, in the Nature article, a decrease in snow-covered areas and snow volumes. That's the freshwater loss. Uh, and of course, the hydrological changes also affect downstream communities in Southeast Asia with the, the timing of the hydrological cycle for um, fisheries and agriculture. In terms of what this really means for herders living on the plateau, um, I'll mention a few effects. One is that most of the lakes on the Tibetan Plateau are um, actually uh, closed basin. Is that, that means that they're actually saline rather than freshwater. Uh, and because of melting permafrost, melting glaciers, 
um, increased rainfall in some places, they're actually expanding. Um, and what that does is it, um, it decreases the grassland availability and affects the soil around the area. And that, that increases the pressure on herders to, uh, to move off the land together with, um, with government policies of uh, various kinds. There's also a decrease in the availability of caterpillar fungus um, and caterpillar fungus harvest is, uh, Yartsugumbu is very important for, um, for rural livelihoods. It's a very, very important source of cash income, has been since the mid nineties and is particularly important for herders who've been uh, resettled and may not have other sources of uh, significant income. It's also led to increased uh, vulnerability to uh, livestock loss during snowstorms. So snowstorms are becoming more frequent and intense. Um, livestock sensitivity is increasing because of grassland degradation. And then other policies have decreased uh, people's uh, kind of ability to cope with the storms. Uh, climate change is also responsible for a lot of ecological changes, um, more so recent studies suggest than actual grazing. So the government's policies are based on the idea that uh, grazing is responsible for a lot of degradation, but um, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that it's really um, that it's really climate change. And so that includes just uh, decreasing plant uh, uh, diversity and quality, particularly of medicinal plants, decreasing vegetation height, uh, lower weight of livestock, less healthy livestock, uh, milking starting later, later and decreased milk production. Um, and yeah, so, so climate change is really kind of combined with uh, policies that have reduced mobility for grass, for herders to, um, to, uh, you know, again, lead to more grassland degradation. And those combined with other policies have, have started to drive people um, kind of off the land where they have uh, ties to tr traditional territory. Um, in terms of what China has done, I mean, I, I do think it's important to keep in mind that since 2006, China has been the largest annual producer of greenhouse gas emissions, but historically and per capita, the U.S. is bears the brunt of the responsibility. So the U.S. is 20 percent of cumulative emissions, and it's uh, more than double of China's per capita emissions still. So if we're looking for who to blame for climate change, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's it's my home country. Um, uh, more than China, um, and uh, that's important to keep in mind. Um, in terms of you know uh, what Tibetan herders can do to to mitigate the problem, it's not their responsibility to mitigate climate change, which they've contributed very little to. But certainly, uh, studies that, that I've been involved with have shown that um, you know they have a lot of traditional practices and knowledge, uh, including collective grazing that is much better for the grasslands than the current policies. Um, and uh, their knowledge uh, working together with, rather than just being like verified by science can actually advance our, our knowledge, collective knowledge of these ecosystems as well. So I think that's about five minutes and I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you so much, Emily. And that's exactly five minutes. Thank you so much for your concern uh, to us time. And, uh, and yeah, let's uh, move on to David. Let's hear your perspective on this. Thanks very much, Sakina. And it's actually challenging to follow up after Emily because uh, she did such a nice job of providing an overview of the climate change impacts on Tibet. Of course, increasing temperatures, uh, changing precipitation patterns, increases in extreme weather events. These are things that we're seeing all around the world, but they have particular impact in the Tibet region. and. The Tibet region is part of what scientists call the third pole because there's more ice in this region than anywhere else on Earth except for the Arctic and the Antarctic. And this is a region that provides drinking water and agricultural water for more than 2 billion people in the Asia region. And so this is a critically important area from a global perspective. And the impacts of climate change, as Emily alluded to, on that, on those hydrological systems are both short-term and long-term. So we're seeing, for example, flooding that's uh, occurring in, in, in certain areas because of the acceleration of melting of glaciers. But the projections in the long-term are that because of that melting, the river flows will actually decrease. So major river systems like the Ganges and the Yangtze River 
are in long-term jeopardy. It's not going to happen this year or next year, but over the decades ahead, unless we address the climate crisis, then there will be severe ramifications for people living downstream of uh, Tibet. And so I think that's a key point. In terms of emissions, uh, Emily touched on the fact that China is now the world's leading producer of greenhouse gas emissions, more than double the United States. China is responsible for about 26 or 27 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions every year. And China burns more coal than the rest of the world combined, which is quite a shocking statistic. The only country in the world that's still approving new coal-fired power plants. And so that's something that needs to change. China has made commitments to uh, bring about a peak in their greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and to ach achieve uh, climate neutrality by 2060. I'm not sure that that pace of change is sufficient given the magnitude of the climate crisis on places like Tibet and other vulnerable regions. On the other hand, I think it's important to say that China is a world leader in terms of solar energy production, wind energy production, electric vehicle production, electric bat or battery production, as well as uh, the use of all of those technologies. So China has made some significant strides in that sense. But I also think it's important when we talk about the climate change to recognize that all states, China included, have obligations that are human rights obligations that relate to the issue of climate change. And those obligations relate to mitigation, adaptation, and climate finance. And so we've talked a bit about mitigation in terms of China taking steps to reduce its, to, to try and stabilize and then reduce its greenhouse gas emissions. But adaptation is a really critically important point that hasn't really been touched on. China has obligations to the people of the Tibet region to take steps to help them prepare for and adapt to the climate changes that are happening because of global action. And when states don't fulfill those obligations, they can be held accountable. So for example, uh, there was a great case a couple of years ago brought by a group of indigenous people from the Torres Strait Islands off the coast of Australia. And they brought a case to the United Nations Human Rights Committee, arguing that Australia had failed to assist them in adapting to the rising sea levels and the extreme weather events that they're suffering on the Torres Strait Islands. And the Human Rights Committee concluded that Australia had violated its obligations and told Australia, the government of Australia that they need to do more to assist the Torres Strait Islanders in adapting to climate change. So my understanding is that there has been a lack of adaptation efforts by the government of China in the Tibet region. And also from a human rights perspective, it is the people of Tibet, including those people who have lived on the land for thousands of years, the herders, um, other pastoralists, those people have the traditional knowledge about how to adapt to changing climates over a period of thousands of years. And they should be the experts that the government of China is listening to in developing and implementing those adaptation policies. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you so much, David. Uh, Lofsangla, let's hear your perspective on this. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Asia Freedom Institute for having me. And it's also a great honor to share this platform with two very extreme uh, experts uh, on the subject. Uh, so with this regard, uh, the question, uh, I, I feel like uh, Emily and David uh, covered all the issues related to climate change. Uh, but I think uh, I would like to you know, give some examples and uh, some a bit of a data in, in terms of climate change on the Tibetan plateau. So as uh, both the previous speakers uh, said, temperature rise, right? So I think now in, in terms of the, the temperature rise in, in, in Tibet, so there are studies saying that so the grassland now almost like a desertified sandy uh, uh, soil. Uh, so these glaciers, you know, reaching over sometimes, you know, 30 degree or sometimes even 40 degrees Celsius. And so this uh, is the new normal that we see on the Tibetan plateau. And then second, uh, in, in terms of uh, glaciers, right? Glaciers are melting really fast. And uh, so, I think there are several studies we're saying that uh, the glacier, which uh, is the source of the Yangtze River, uh, has uh, shrunk, uh, you know, significantly between the 
1980s and uh, uh, and and today as well and also the glaciers where yalong zambo flows right and so the these glaciers have also re retreated almost like 400 meters over the past uh, 12 years uh, as well and then there are studies that china has also carried out two surveys on the glaciers where the data shows that between the mid 1950s and uh, around 2014 uh, the glaciers uh, shrunk by almost like 18% in in terms of area and then uh, i think uh, in terms of climate change uh, lake uh, your expanding is uh, uh, another problem that we see and over the last 50 years i would say the size of the you know the lakes have increased from like uh, uh, 1081 to almost like 1236 uh, uh, in terms of the total area as well and then permafrost melting is another uh, issue that we see on the tibetan plateau where uh, the 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 uh, permafrost has uh, shrunk by almost like uh, 39% uh, or it will shrunk by 39% in mid uh, century which makes uh, between 19, uh, 2030 to 2050 as well and then desertification and grassland degradation is another problem that we see over here so i mean other than that i mean yes climate change is a big problem that we see on the tibetan plateau but there are also other policies that the Chinese government, uh, you know, follows, such as, uh, you know, mining and uh, energy infrastructure and urbanization pro projects uh, across the whole Tibetan plateau also affects the ecosystem health of the uh, region as well. And then unregulated and, uh, you know, uh, illegal mining project across, across Tibet, um, you know, threatens the lives and uh, livelihood of Tibetans and also the uh, downstream nation as well. And then what is China doing? As uh, earlier David talked about uh, China being the leader of uh, solar power and uh, wind power. But recently, you know, there are many news where coming that, you know, China is building lots of uh, solar power or solar energy on the, on the grassland. And now I, I, I feel that there should be more research on whether this grassland uh, will have an impact of uh, you know, having solar solar panels uh, on the on the grassland for a really uh, long long time, and then I think in terms finally, I think uh, Sakina, when you asked about the traditional knowledge, uh, inclusion of Tibetans uh, and their traditional knowledge in policy making is really really important, and then also I think uh, um, other than the inclusion of uh, you know Tibetan nomads in the policy making i think recognizing the gender and uh, gender aspect in terms of the uh, policy making and uh, policy uh, implementation is really really important and so these policies should also acknowledge the community's uh, right to water you know forests and natural resources uh, as well so i think that now uh, there are policies where unable to understand or address the gender differentiated challenges uh, people face when in, in, in terms of uh, water security and uh, climate uh, crisis that we see on the Tibetan plateau. So when we talk about uh, you know, inclusion of local people in the uh, policy making, I feel that gender is another aspect that the policy makers, they should really uh, you know, consider an important aspect. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Lopsangla, and thank you so much to all our speakers. I think the first, the answers to the first question gave an overall view and a very good opening for the rest of our discussion. Emily spoke about the overall view of the climate crisis in Tibet. Uh, David spoke about the failure of the adaptation policies of the Chinese government and China and the and China's obligations towards the Tibetan people in Tibet. And Lopsangla touched upon the other policies of the uh, of the Chinese government threatening the livelihood of the Tibetan people and you also spoke about the involvement of the um, the local Tibetans into the decision making and we shall delve more into that. Now let's go more into specific and um, I would like to start with Emily first. 
So Emily, uh, in your research, you've uh, written about the Tibetan nomads in Tibet, and uh, they're having a long history, close to 8,000 years, uh, regarding pastoralism. And Tibetan pastoral pastoralists have uh, become the core target of the extremely high altitude resettlement program, uh, uh, especially in the Nangchu region, which is the largest pastoral region on the plateau, with nearly 80% of the population comprising Tibetan pastoralists. How has the Chinese government's resettlement program for Tibetan nomads under the guise of environmental protection disrupted their traditional lifestyles? And what can be done to address this issue? Uh, the screen is yours, Emily. Great, thank you for that question. Um, so I let me connect this question a little bit to some things that David mentioned. Uh, the, the extremely high altitude resettlement project is a fairly new one and um, uh, it's a little bit, it, it, they do mention climate as a rationale. They also mention um, development as a rationale. And, and ironically, the government says that, you know, it's not, uh, these very, very high altitude areas are not fit for human habitation. And it's quite ironic because this particular area from which people are being resettled was in fact, historically not a, an area of form of permanent settlement, but was made an area of permanent settlement by um by government policies for increasing production a few decades ago. Um, but uh, there are other more longstanding resettlement projects that have occurred in the Sanjiang Yuan area. And um, those actually have been linked directly in Chinese policy to adaptation, right? There's been the statement that the way to adapt is to remove people from the grasslands. So I think in China, as in places around the world, Bangladesh is a very good example, uh, adaptation can create, or, or things called adaptation can create new forms of dispossession and uh, legitimate dispossession uh, because of the ways, because of the broader political and social environmental relations into which this intervenes. So I think that's always important to keep in mind. So for studies of people who have been uh, resettled from these areas in Sanjiang Yuan, you have, um, of course, issues of subsidies, not keeping up with inflation inflation, you have rising costs, you have employment um, as, a, as a very big problem for people who are resettled. Herding is a very complex set of skills um, that is then uh, kind of left behind. Um, people face labor market discrimination. Um, and, um, and of course, you have displacement, so uh, kind of, uh, deter you know, uh, dispossessing people of ties to territory, including sacred lakes, sacred mountains, um, which are tied to territorial deities, which are uh, deeply intertwined with Tibetan concepts of like young or fortune um, and, and certainly community identity. So those are, are all, um, you know, very big uh, issues. Um, and, and more generally, I think, um, you know, the Chinese state is taking environmental protection uh, uh, very seriously. And um, it, it seems like what's being done in the name of environmental protection more than environmental destruction at this point is, is what is actually most threatening for, for uh, cultural continuity. Um, you know, what can be done on a policy level? Um, I, that's a tough one. Uh, but I will also say that when you read these statistics, it's always... Uh, more than what's happening on the ground, right? So there's always much more messiness on the ground in terms of who's actually moving are the numbers that they claim have moved, which is a good thing, um, you know, from the government perspective of meeting its goals versus what's actually happening. So I think in reality, the situation is much messier in terms of displacement. So, uh, that's my three minutes, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Emily, for, uh uh, for for this really valuable information about uh, the plight of the herders in Tibet, and uh, mo moving on to David, David, in your reports you've highlighted how um, climate change just proportionately impacts the marginalized communities who actually contribute very minimal to the problem, yet they suffer the most uh, to, uh, due to the external policies and activities. And given the limitations of the environmental law in addressing these issues, why do you think that it is crucial to integrate uh, human rights perspectives into climate change policies and interventions, particularly in the context um, like Tibet, David? Yes, thank you very much, Sakina. Let me just first uh, follow up on what Emily said by saying as clearly as I possibly can that forced resettlement 
of any human community is a human rights violation, period. There is no justification for forcing people to move without their consent, their prior and free and informed consent. That's a really key point. Um, in terms of uh, the importance of a human rights perspective, what we, if we look back at over 30 years of experience with the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Kyoto Protocol, the Paris Agreement, these international environmental treaties that are intended to address the climate crisis, we find that none of them, met, first of all, none of them have accountability or enforcement mechanisms that work. And so that fundamental weakness, which is true of international environmental law in general, is a, a huge reason why the world has failed to successfully address problems, including climate change, pollution, and the collapse of biological diversity because of the lack of effective enforcement mechanisms in international environmental law. And that's where a human rights perspective can really be valuable because human rights law brings mechanisms and processes and institutions that can be used to hold governments accountable. And so when we bring international environmental law as the substance and we bring in the international human rights law as the process, then we can actually find ourselves making progress towards addressing these challenges. And so, for example, there have been court cases around the world in Belgium, in the Netherlands, in Germany, in Colombia, in Costa Rica, where governments have been held accountable by their people for not taking sufficient climate action. Um, people using their human rights to bring their own governments to court. And so that's very promising and encouraging. One of the challenges when we're dealing with China is that China is not renowned for respecting human rights. Uh, China is one of the only countries in the world that voted against the United Nations, or didn't vote against, sorry, abstained from the United Nations General Assembly resolution, recognizing that everyone has the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. And so, that, that kind of Chinese opposition to human rights is a huge obstacle in holding China accountable. But China is susceptible to international pressure, and I think that's where some of these international human rights mechanisms and processes can be used to shine a spotlight on the uh, Chinese government's failure to respect, protect, and fulfill people's human rights, particularly in the context of Tibet. Uh, thank you so much, David, for very interestingly uh, telling us about the importance of uh, having the human rights perspective. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So sorry. Uh, thank you so much, David, for very interesting telling us about uh, the, uh, like, you know, incorporation of the human rights perspective in uh, the climate crisis. And moving on to Lop Sangla. Uh, Lop Sangla, with your background in China-Tibet relations and your 2016 uh, visit to Tibet, uh, could you describe the changes you observed there? How does the Chinese government's approach to environmental decision-making affect uh, the participation of the local Tibetans, considering that top roles in uh, environmental organizations are mostly held by Chinese officials? Can you also elaborate on how the Chinese government controls the, in, uh, the involvement in environmental decision-making processes? Love Sangla. Uh, thank you, Sakina. Mm, I think, yeah, I mean, so in 2016, I had the chance to visit uh, Tibet. Uh, so in one of the village that, uh, you know, I visited, uh, so I was talking to the locals. And so at the local level, they said that, you know, they have an environment, uh, you know, voluntary environment uh, uh, group. Uh, so so they there are few people in the environment group and so i asked them what is their role uh, so basically they are a part of the environment uh, protection group at the local level uh, but then they really don't know uh, what is their role and uh, so they were they were like so we have been uh, you know in this group uh, but we haven't given any specific uh, role but uh, we are here in this group because we get some subsidies uh, uh, from the from the government so which in a way says that i mean yes uh, in in terms of policy making there are policies like really good policy in terms of environment protection and also uh, rules and regulations but at the implementation level i think there is a 
lack of proper uh, implementation and uh, also uh, sakina when you talk about local participation or public participation in the policy making i think it's very important that when we talk about pu public participation it has to have uh, you know access to information uh, and then uh, opportunity to participate in decision making and also government should facilitate uh, public awareness and then very important and crucial is access to judicial effective judicial and uh, administrative proceedings right so in all of this uh, it's very important for us to see whether these uh, you know uh, you know the factors and involved when we talk about public participation in the policy making as such so when we look at uh, you know suppose if we look at public participation in china's uh, water law right and other uh, policies or laws that uh, is there in china so suppose if we talk about uh, 1982 constitution which amended again in uh, 2018 uh, it has uh, say very little about the public participation and then five year plans you know they also facilitate public participation as a recommendation but then it is not strictly or legally uh, required as well and then in terms of environment protection law uh, environment protection law also identifies uh, public participation as a basic principle but then with information disc uh, disclosure as well and then uh, environment impact assessment is really really important but uh, in the environment impact assessment public participation is compulsory uh, but the scope of application is really uh, limited uh, uh, limited as well so uh, then you know i think uh, david also talked about the environment related treaties where it has a very limited effect uh, enforcement power uh, and uh, so even though China has uh, also been part of UNFCCC and then convention to combat the desertification, but then in, at the, you know, the participation obligation uh, is, uh, has been a very weak, uh, you know, uh, in terms of action plans at the China's national level as well. So, I mean, when we talk about public participation, so at the at the ground level, uh, you know, implementation is a challenge. And so we also talk about the the rights of the uh, environmental human rights defenders and the case like Kama Samdu, who established the Snowland uh, Great Rivers Environment Protection Association in uh, Yushu, uh, but then uh, he has been sentenced in 2010 uh, for like 15 years. So there is, with, with the Tibet at the ground level, sometimes there is the possibility that China criminalizes the environment activism and then those environment uh, defenders who are in prison or who are in jail, there is very limited information on them. And then we have seen, uh, you know, uh, quite a large number of, uh, you know, the protest and then also protests against the mining and then illegal land grabs and also damming as well. So I think uh, I would like to say that in terms of implementation, I think the Chinese government still needs to, you know, take a more a proper implementation of the policies that they have and then at the local level sometimes i think in in terms of policy implementation i would also like to say that implementation would be different from each uh, you know village to each uh, uh, village uh, but then at some cases you know the uh, i i think that people end up in jail because of you know speaking out against the mining or other you know uh, uh, activities that has an impact on local people and environment as well Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Lopsang La, for sharing uh, your experience in Tibet and also for also telling us about the importance of how the local people should be a participant of the policy uh, policy dis decision making in in the environmental policy and also like you've touched upon the environmental activism, which uh, we will be talking with uh, David. So moving on with Emily. So Emily, based on your extensive research in Tibetan um, 
in Tibetan uh, in Tibetan areas and your understanding in uh, China's uh, Promethean environmentalism approach, which addresses environmental issues through technological solutions. Could you provide insights on China's efforts to scale up weather modification practices? What are the consequences of such practices, particularly on the people living in the region? Also, can you tell us what um, is the perspective of the atmospheric scientists on these technological interventions? Uh, Emily. Uh, yeah, great. Thank you for the question. This is a little bit of a, a side interest of mine. Um, so uh, there was in around 2016 or 2017, um, a widely touted uh, sort of um, effort that was reported in the press about how um, China was going to scale up weather modification or cloud seeding to divert uh, atmospheric moisture over the Himalayas and channel them to Northern China. Um, so this was supposed to be a scaling up of uh, cloud seeding. Cloud seeding is a practice of shooting uh, silver iodide uh, mostly into clouds in order to create more condensation nuclei that will then fall as rain. Um, so in fact, cloud seeding is, is very, very common around the world. China is the world's biggest player in this, but the U.S. is second. Um, and there's about 70 countries, 60, 70 countries around the world which are doing it now. Um, it's a pretty localized effect and um, it hasn't been that widespread uh, or, or, you know, people don't know about it um, as much. Uh, atmospheric scientists have been skeptical that it even works at all. Um, so, uh, you know, so let me cut to the chase and say that that was a very interesting project that was proposed. They get, did get some money, um, to do this sort of like, uh, techno optimist view of, of uh, manipulating the atmosphere, but basically, um, uh, it's, it's not possible. <laughs> <laughs> you can't, uh, you know, you can't uh, intervene in uh, the Himalayans and, and channel channel water in the sky like a river. So to me, it's more interesting as um, reflective of a certain kind of imagination of nature. And again, I let me say that this techno optimist view of nature is not limited to China. There's plenty of it going on in the climate change sphere at the international level with geoengineering. Uh, and I think it's very problematic. But um, but because I, I study Tibet, that, that's like where I encountered it. And it certainly does uh, influence kind of Chinese views of ecology um, uh, at the state level. Um, so uh, in terms of how it, it uh, imp impacts local people, um, you know, there's not a lot of regulation. There was a, a, a video online from uh, the drought a couple of years ago where, you know, there's like security footage of a couple people walking by a little a little store, Xiaomaibu, and like this rocket like barely misses them. That's not in the Tibetan area. That's that's just like in Chengdu or some, uh, some Chinese city. But there are um, cases where Tibetan herders, for example, will find um, these parts of rockets that kind of like land in their um, that land in their pastures. And so uh, it's certainly a problem from that perspective. I do want to make clear that what I'm talking about here is weather modification, which is distinct from geoengineering in 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 the way that I'm using the term. Um, so the, the effects are quite um, uh, are quite localized. And atmospheric scientists uh, basically think that that idea of the Sky River is, um, is ridiculous. Um, uh, but people have picked it up in a sort of nationalist way that says, you know, those people who tell us we can't do it, they just don't understand, um, you know, how, how powerful China is. But again, there's a lot of Chinese scientists who, who think the whole thing is, is quite flawed and um, not really scientific as well. Uh, thank you so much, Emily. Actually, that was the part that I was um, enjoying reading when I was reading uh, your research, research paper. Thank you so much for giving us more information on that. And now moving on to David. And David, as a UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment, how do you view the concerns raised by UN human rights experts on the imprisonment of the nine Tibetan environmental defenders in China? These individuals were reportedly imprisoned for their peaceful efforts in combating illegal mining and protecting endangered species in Tibet. What implications does this situation have for international human rights law and what steps can the UN and the 
the international community take to address this issue in Tibet? David. Thanks, Sakina. So let's be let's be clear about what environmental human rights defenders are, first of all. Those are people who are working to protect the rights of themselves, their families, their communities, and other people, as well as the environment that all of us depend on as a life support system here on planet Earth. I think, you know, environmental human rights defenders is kind of a cumbersome phrase. I like to just call these people environmental heroes because that's what they are. They're environmental heroes, they're human rights heroes. And they are exercising their basic human rights to freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of assembly, human rights which have been at the core of international human rights law since the Universal Declaration in 1948. So the fact that governments, including the Chinese government, but again, this, as Emily has suggested, this is part of a global pattern of harassment, repression, intimidation, violence, and criminalization against environmental human rights defenders that is happening all across the world. Uh, but it's completely indefensible, unjustifiable. And the United Nations is doing everything we can to try and emphasize that environmental human rights defenders are providing a critically important public service in the face of these planetary environmental challenges that we face. And so we have a United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Human Rights Defenders. We have a Human Rights Council resolution specifically on environmental human rights defenders. My colleague, uh, the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights Defenders, a terrific woman by the name of Mary Lawler, does amazing work in raising the profile of these cases by sending letters to the governments, asking them to explain their, their rationale behind these actions. And at the end of the day, these patterns of criminalization, as in the case of these nine environmental human rights defenders in Tibet, are completely indefensible. These people should be freed as soon as humanly possible. They should be compensated for their time in, in prison. And the government should stop this pattern of harassment, intimidation, and criminalization. Uh, thank you so much, David, uh, for this really strong words and and uh, thank you for giving a clear definition uh, for the environmental defenders. Thank you, David. And uh, moving on to Lufsangla. Lufsangla, in your role as a researcher and campaigner for the International Campaign for Tibet, could you share with us some insights on the types of campaign that you have organized related to Tibet's environment and climate change? How successful have these campaigns been in achieving the objectives, particularly in raising awareness and influencing policy decisions regarding Tibet? Lufsangla. Uh, thank you, uh, Sakina. So we have for... Uh, um, organize various campaigns uh, related to Tibet's environment and uh, climate change. So one uh, effort that we try to do is try to bring the issue of uh, Tibet's uh, climate crisis into global climate discussion uh, by participating in UN climate change uh, COP meetings and UN water conferences and water week in Sweden, and also participating in climate uh, global climate strike. But how successful or awareness that we could create? I think uh, um, I think the climate campaign itself is a very difficult uh, work, and uh, so especially at these big uh, events or or UN meetings, so, so everyone comes there with their own issue. But I feel like that uh, if if I uh, you know compare with my uh, first experience of COP in Paris and then. Uh, to Egypt, uh, I feel like there has been a, a, a bit of awareness and understanding uh, knowledge uh, on the other uh, uh, climate uh, experts or researchers. But uh, at the these big events, um, uh, one challenge that we see is or we face is that uh, there is no special seat for the seats for the you know uh, colonized people. So whenever the Tibet groups we attend, uh, so we are attend as uh, observer status and we get our accreditations through other universities uh, contacts that we have. So that itself is a bit challenging right now. And then the second, uh, we try to release a report, uh, reports on uh, specifically on environment defenders. And as David earlier, Sakina, you uh, also talked about the uh, UN Special Rapporteurs, uh, you know, uh, 
statement in terms of environment defenders so that i think uh, i think uh, is i would say that one success that we could we could ga gain uh, you know uh, un experts or special reporters um, you know uh, you know attention on the on the issue but uh, i also feel that you know um maybe you know we also would like to push more for you know independent um, you know experts or un special reporters uh, to to visit uh, tibet and then see the ground uh, you know uh, ground level stories or 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 the situation i think that's one in a in a future we 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 would like to put more effort and then we also try to build uh, networks and collaborations with uh, scholars and experts from downstream nation especially in terms of water security and i think it's also going well but uh, sometimes uh, uh, it's it's a bit challenging because of the chinese influence in their respective countries but i think there is a huge scope and uh, so there is uh, still we need to do lots of uh, work in terms of building connections and network uh, with the downstream uh, countries as well and uh, then uh, currently we are also working on lithium uh, lithium mining campaign and uh, so we are pitching this idea with other tibet groups and hopefully you know that this this campaign can also bring some attention and for me i think uh, my main objective is to to see changes uh, inside tibet uh, so yeah i think uh, so lithium uh, mining campaign uh, hopefully would bring some positive impact inside tibet thank you uh thank you lopsangla for sharing with us more information about your campaign and thank you so much for your effort on raising awareness on the climate crisis and its impact on human rights in tibet now moving on to our final uh question uh, emily i would like to start with you uh emily in december 2022 uh, china announced uh, the selection of 49 candidate uh, cities uh, 49 candidate sites for building national parks, including 13 on the Tibetan Plateau. And the total includes like five parks, which have already been uh, developed into national parks since 2017. Uh, the 13 on the Tibetan Plateau accounts for 70% of the total area of the national park candidates. Uh, China's plan is to develop a countrywide national park system by 2035. What are your thoughts on the proposed plan, which may fear will lead to widespread uh, disempowerment, uh, demobilization, and displacement of Tibetans and other marginalized communities? Uh, how can such developments both mitigate uh, climate change and also benefit the Tibetan people? Emily. Uh, yeah, thank you for your question. Um, you know, we, we still don't know <clears throat> a lot about the national park system, um, and that's because the declaration of the parks has sort of um, outpaced legal frameworks for national parks within China. So um, it's a little bit unclear how they're all going to work out, even though it's been several years now. Um, there, I think it's it's interesting to note that in the, you know, like why Xi Jinping decided to have national park systems when they already had national reserves and scenic areas and many, many other categories of nature protection is unclear to me. Um, one explanation is that the national park system is meant to try to streamline the bureaucracy of the over overlapping existing nature uh, conservation categories. Although so far that streamlining, it seems to be another layer rather than streamlining. And that has to do with just, I think, internal bureaucratic power struggles between different uh, parts of the, um, you know, the, the different line ministries within China. Um, it is important to note that, for example, the Sanjiang Yuan, uh, sort of the Three Rivers um, National Park, is about half the size of the original reserve, um, which is, you know, probably a good thing. Uh, the 
the US-based Paulson Institute was involved in consulting for the design of that park. Uh, there, there are certainly Western-based conservationists who are very uh, enthusiastic about that park, including its um, ranger program, right? So there is supposed to be a participatory program where one, uh, you know, one household, one member of each household, or at least a sizable number of households, are paid to be rangers. Uh, what I understand to be happening on the ground is that in some of the villages in that area, there have already before the park been waves of out migration. So it started with uh, some ecological resettlement, but there are also um, other things that are not nature conservation that are are pushing people off the rangelands. Those include educational policies. They include just a broad um, prioritization within China of urban areas. Uh, certainly, you do have a lot of parents now who don't want their kids to be pastoralists because they feel that that's not uh, the way to achieve success, right? And and um, so you uh, you have you have um, you know in that sense, voluntary migration uh, out of the, the grassland areas, including these areas as well. And so when the ranger program came along, I do think there are some people who are already resettled, who are living quite far away, who then the ranging program becomes a subsidy where they go back like once a month and take some pictures of the grassland and then they uh, get a, you know, a, a sus subsidy from that. So it's a complicated story. It's not really clear what will happen. There's certainly, you know, we certainly wouldn't want to see um, uh, further restrictions on people living in the park. I had heard rumors a number of years ago of a, you know, possible national park in another grassland area where there might be more grazing restrictions. And that would be very, very problematic, be again, because um, of the assumption that it's grazing that's leading to degradation. And that's, um, you know, that's, that's uh, not, in fact, um, the case. And I forgot to time myself, so I'm not sure kind of where I am. Uh, in terms of time. So, but, but, you know, with the Great Panda National Park right now as well, uh, a lot of shutting down of uh, county level mines, the county governments are not happy about that. Uh, there's some employment issues. They're not all Tibetan. There are some Tibetan, some non-Tibetan. Um, from an environmental standpoint, you probably do want to shut down those, um, those, those mines. Um, so I, I think it's mixed. There hasn't been resettlement from that park to date. Um, you know, there is negotiations around where the where the, the boundaries are. There's certainly an effort to, you know, uh, increase ecotourism um, and that can play out in, in both positive and uh, negative ways. Um, can it mitigate climate change? Again, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about nature-based solutions. There was something that came out recently that said the Tibetan Plateau was was already carbon neutral and could play more of a role in absorbing carbon. I mean, I'm very skeptical of all these efforts to like quantify and 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 use this to like offset carbon elsewhere. I mean, I think the the answer to mitigating carbon uh, climate change is to stop fossil fuels. And and again, that's that's China, but it's also um, the U.S. Um, I do think, you know, ecotourism can have potential to benefit Tibetans. I do know Tibetans who have moved to the city and who have decided to move back home, uh, not in the national park, and, and they want to make their way on the grasslands into the future in ecotourism. But it's all just very contingent on what the what the local regulations are, what the local relations with the local state are, um, and so on. So, so I guess I don't know, and I think um, I think it's an open question of what will happen with these national parks. Uh, thank you so much, Emily. Uh, David, let's hear your perspective on this. Yes, thank you very much. And just quickly, uh, I want to respond quickly to one thing that Lob Sang said about uh, having United Nations special rapporteurs visit China and, in particular, Tibet. Uh, five years ago, I asked the government of China for permission to do a country visit, and uh, was not I was not successful. So um, it's very difficult to gain access to China from the perspective of special rapporteurs. In terms of uh, increasing national parks, well, you know, countries of the world came together in 1992 to create the Convention on Biodiversity and to protect the world's natural wonders, and has countries across the world have failed to meet the targets that they set for themselves under the Convention on Biodiversity. Countries came together again in Montreal in December of 2022 and created the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework 
in which every country committed to protect 30% of their lands. And so China's expansion of national parks is consistent with that commitment because China currently does not protect 30% of its lands. However, the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework is also really important because it puts the rights of people at the heart of conservation and says that when governments are creating new protected areas, whether they're national parks, state parks, whatever they are, they have to respect, protect, and fulfill the rights of the people who are living in those areas. And that means engaging with them in consultation. That means ensuring that they uh, enjoy a a percentage or a share of the benefits that are created by establishing these protected areas. And so I think that's really fundamentally important. If China is going to create national parks in Tibet, it has to be done with human rights at the forefront of that park uh, creation process. And we've seen in countries such as Canada and Australia that when you actually put local communities and in particular indigenous peoples at the forefront of these park creation processes, then you can have very successful outcomes where those people make the decisions about where protection should be, what activities should be permitted, and how conservation can be carried out. So I think there is a path forward that actually respects human rights and creates greater protection for nature, but it has to be done by putting local people at the forefront. And I just want to say, it's my last comment here, is thank you very much again for the opportunity to join you. I've learned a lot from listening to my colleagues, Emily and Lobsang, and so thank you to all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Um, and Lobsang, let us hear your perspective on this. Um, yeah, I think uh, I don't have much uh, new uh, information to share. I think Emily and both David covered uh, almost all the uh, issues related to national park but i think for me uh, i would see that maybe you know the ccp leaders they would see national park system as an asset uh, for soft power or or in the name or or the development or the modernity and pov poverty elevation in 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 uh, tibet uh, so i think maybe Declaring these new uh, national parks also eases uh, pressure on China to reduce its uh, climate heating uh, emission as well. Because I think uh, no way in the rationale for excluding Tibetan more elaborate than in the national park planning. Uh, so with its uh, core zones in where uh, all human presence uh, is classified as a threatening and then surrounded by buffer zones uh, where there is a limited human uh, presence and also under strict surveillance as well. And then there is uh, experimental zones where permissible human activity is uh, also another debatable as well. So Horsan Gale, um, uh, one of the uh, very, uh, uh, Tibetan expert on, on uh, grassland and uh, uh, so he 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 says that you know since uh, Mao's era uh, the Tibet environment has been uh, refrained uh, as the sovereign uh, property of the Chinese state, where it erases the um, uh, Tibetans' eff effective and historical relationship with their their uh, land land as, as well. Uh, and then I think what happens the. Earlier, uh, Emily also talked about the ranch lands. So what is the role of uh, uh, Tibetans in, in this national park is the uh, the uh, land management and where, where the Tibetans, they get, uh, you know, uh, the, it, it says that it is a community collaborative management where, you know, the locals, they get, uh, you know, park rangers uh, role as well. And uh, then where these people are supposed to you know, enforce the grazing bans and also remove the nomads to be displaced where the uh, grazing is not uh, um, allowed. Uh, but then most of this land management and uh, conservation rights, uh, so what happens is that once people are agreed to remove, then the, the, the conservation rights and land management, uh, the rights, it belongs to the state and also includes including the nature reserve authorities, uh, whereas the local community will uh, lack in terms of uh, conservation and also they, they, there is a possibility of uh, cancellation of the land tenure rights uh, as, as well. 
And then recently, in, in terms of, uh, suppose with the Sanjay Nguyen, uh, where people are removed, uh, and uh, recently at uh, Geneva, uh, when the uh, China's Universal Periodic Review happened, uh, and uh, so the uh, the Chinese uh, representative, uh, she said that, you know, these um, Tibetan nomads who have uh, removed from the uh, grassland, uh, they said that it, it, it was their willingness, uh, it was a voluntary. But then, you know, the whole relocation process, you know, presented uh, as a displacement. And so it present, uh, they present and their project is as a voluntary decision. And, and it calls ecological migrants. But then in, in the uh, voluntaries, uh, so there is also incentive or there are various steps uh, how people are removed where uh, uh, one is induced uh, voluntarism. And then, you know, the second is that once you are not volunteer to, you know, migrate, or uh, um, move from that grassland, uh, then you know there is also a, a, a kind of compulsory uh, where you are forced to you know uh, relocate, and then there is one-to-one -one education and guidance provided to the locals, where at the end you know they have to you know remove. So I think there are various issues uh, related to that, and as Emily. Uh, said, I think, uh, in terms of national parks, and uh, there is all still uh, more research to be done. And uh, but the most important is, uh, as as we earlier discussed, uh, inclusion of people in the whole policy making and making sure that their rights are protected, and making sure that their voices are heard in the whole decision making. Uh, I think is really really important. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Lop Sangla, and I would like to thank all our speakers. Uh, we have come to the end of the discussion uh, for giving us your invaluable um, insights about uh, this very crucial topic. And I wish all of you a very happy Losar. Today is uh, the Tibetan New Year's Eve. So I really hope that this year will bring uh, lots of happiness and uh, more to human rights not just in Tibet, but across the world. Thank you so much uh, to all our speakers. And I would also like to um, thank all our viewers uh, tuning in from across the globe and to all uh, those who have participated, like even behind the screen uh, for this event uh, to happen and uh, make it successful. Thank you so much, everyone. And uh, finally, I just want to say that uh, if you want uh, to get the full link of this video session, you can always go to AFI's website. And I would like to request you to please follow AFI's social media platforms for more information on AFI programs and activities. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.